Okay, so in this one, I'm gonna teach you how to handle form submission in Spring Boot. We're not gonna do anything extra special in this one. We're gonna to stick to the basics. So what I mean by that is we're not gonna use a templating engine like Timeleaf, and we're not gonna use any JavaScript. We're gonna to stick to the basics of HTML, CSS, and Spring Boot. So what we have here is a very basic project. Now, if we take a look at the dependencies in pom.xml here, we can see it's almost fresh from the Spring Boot initializer. We have Spring Starter Web, Spring Boot starter validation because we'll do some validation a little bit later on. And then we have Lombok as well, just to make things a little bit easier for us. And this is all we have. Now, in terms of the project, there's nothing in controllers, nothing in domain. The entry point is very basic, nothing extra special here. What we do have though is in resources static is some files. So we've got the index.html, error HTML, and success HTML. And these represent three static HTML pages. In index.html, we have a form. It essentially posts, you can see here, method post to forward slash contact. And it's a, it's cool tutorial form, that's the ID, but it's essentially a contact form, right? So we have the first name field in here, the last name field in here, and then the comment field in here as well, which is a text area, which is a little bit different. Because we've placed these files in the static directory, when we start up our Spring Boot application, we will already be able to hit these in our browser. So we'll go ahead and do that now, I think. So let's go down to our terminal and we'll use the Maven wrapper. So that's uh, this one here or this one here on Windows. And we're gonna say spring hyphen boot run. And that's gonna run our application for us. Okay, application is up and running. Let's flip over to our browser. Okay, and here's our browser. So we can see here, everything is rendered. There's our first name field, our last name field, and we have a comment section as well. But if we type in some information here, it doesn't do anything because we don't have that forward slash contact available inside of our Spring Boot application. So that's the first thing that we're going to have to implement. So let's flip back over to our code base. Now let's go over to our controllers directory and there isn't a controller here. So we'll need to create one to handle our form submission. So we're gonna create a new file and I'm gonna call this one um, contact form controller.java. So what we'll do first of all, is we're going to add an annotation on here at controller. Now this is different from rest controller because controller is going to return pages for us. So it's gonna be able to render pages whereas rest controller would just be returning a response body. In fact, the rest controller annotation is a combination of at controller and at response body. But we don't need the response body here because we're not building a rest API in this case. So let's implement our endpoint, shall we? So first things first, we're going to need to specify the request mapping annotation. And that's going to allow us to specify the HTTP method and also the path that we're expecting. And we already know these from our index.html. So first things first, let's specify our path. And that's going to be forward slash contact. And then we get to specify our HTTP method, which we can do with this argument. And we're going to then specify request method dot post. Now we'll specify our method signature, which is going to be a public method and it's going to return a string. Now this is different from the response body that you may be expecting inside of a REST API. The string is gonna represent the file that we want the server to render. So more on that in a moment. We're gonna specify contact form submission. Okay, so we now have a blank method that we need to implement. What do we want to happen when the form is submitted? I think just redirecting to this success.html is the way to go. Success.html just contains the word success with a H1 tag. That's it, it's successful, everything's successful. So let's do that. The common approach that you see in the wild is to generally use JavaScript to make that call for you and then display the message on the screen. But we're going to use straightforward HTML in this case today. So we're gonna render this success out in the case of a success. So what we'll do is return and then redirect colon success.html. So in the case that there is a success, we want to redirect to success.html, which it should find because it's inside of this static directory here. So that's what's going to happen. But notice we're not trying to access any of the information in this form. We'll come on to that in a moment. First things first, let's restart our application and make sure that redirect is working for us. Okay, we're up and running. Let's flip back to the browser. Let's go ahead and click submit and we're expecting it to redirect to the success page. Perfect. So it's redirected to the success page, which means that we are hitting that endpoint successfully. Now let's try and access some information. Quick interruption. So I'm trying to get as many people into software engineering as wants to. So if you found this useful, don't forget to subscribe and why not share this channel with somebody you think could benefit.
The first way I'm gonna show you is by accessing it as a map, a set of key value pairs. And the way that we do this is with the annotation here, request body. And then we need to specify the type, which in this case is going to be the multi-value map. And we'll just call this one values. Now, multi-value map is an extension of the basic map class um, that's used inside of the Spring Framework here. And it's going to allow us to get access to all of those values as key value pairs. So that gives us access to the values, but what are we gonna do with them? So what we'll do is we'll go up here and we're going to do at self 4 j And that's gonna give us access to log. And we're just going to log out the values so we can see them in the logs down below. So we're gonna do log.info, and then we're going to take values and we're going to paste that into log.info there. Oh, and of course we need to call two string on it because it's a map. And just like that, it will print out exactly what we send to this endpoint in the logs below. But let's try this out and we can do this by restarting our application. Okay, application's restarted. Let's refresh this page and let's enter some information here. So I'm gonna go Aaron, born, and my comment for my contact page can be something like that. And this is what we're expecting to be printed out in our logs. So before we submit that, let's do a few new lines and let's submit our form. Okay, we've got a success, that's great. And we can see here, amazing. We've got first is Aaron, last is born. And then we've got the comment here of whatever that is. So that is accessing the values as a map or we can just go ahead and use those. So a map is pretty free form, right? There is an alternative way of doing this where we can pass the information and put it into a Java object. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to do now. So let's get rid of this here and start from fresh. Perfect. We're gonna need a Java object. So let's go over to our domain here and let's create a new file. And we're gonna call this one uh, contactform.java, I think. Okay, and we're gonna put some Lombok annotations on here. So at data to do all of our boilerplate for us. And then we'll have an all args constructor and no args constructor. And then we'll do the builder as well. Now we're not gonna be using all of these annotations today, but these are just a general set that I like to give us full featured data classes. Let's create some instance variables to model our information. So we're going to do a private string and let's call this one first, which matches up to the field that's sent to us. And then we'll do a private string again and call this one last, which represent the last name that's been sent to us. And we will do a private string comment. There we go. And that is going to represent our data class. Let's go back to our controller here and let's configure this to create one of those objects for us on the form submission. Let's use this annotation this time, which is model attribute. And then we'll say we've got a final contact form and we'll call this one contact form, I think. Great, we'll do log.info and we're gonna print out contact form.toString and Lombok will be kind enough to generate this for us. So it will print out all of the information in the logs below. So model attribute will take the information as it's posted to this endpoint and it's going to attempt to pass it into the contact form object using the instant variable names to match up against the fields that are sent to it. And then we should have access to a contact form object. Let's restart our application and see if that works for us. Okay, application's restarted. Let's flip back over to our browser and let's go back to our form. Great, so let's say Bob Bobbington and the comment of, there we go. Let's do some new lines. So we're expecting this to print out the information Bob Bobbington and then that comment having passed out that contact form object. So let's click submit. Okay, we've got success, this is great. Let's go back to our code. There we go, we can see the contact form object was passed successfully. First name Bob, last name Bobbington, and then that comment as well. This is kind of the more OOP approach where we can deal with objects. We have that contact form object that we can then pass on to our service layer or do whatever we want with. Now, I did mention we were going to do some validation earlier. So let's move on to that. If we take a look at the contact form object, it might be the case that we decide one of our business rules is we don't want to take a contact form submission unless the first name and the last name have been provided. The way that we would do that is by using annotations in here. And we get these annotations with that validation package. And we're going to use the annotation of not empty. That's going to validate that this field is not empty. In the case that it is empty, we're going to get, I do believe it's a binding exception. But don't worry too much about that. I'll show you how this works now. Not empty, so the first name can't be empty and the last name can't be empty. In order to enable this, we need to go over to our form controller and where we're using model attribute here, we also want to use another annotation which is at valid. And that's going to activate those validation annotations on the contact form and if they're not met, 
we'll get that binding exception. So let's restart this and try it out. Okay, restarted, flip back over to our browser. And in this case, I'm just going to provide a comment, maybe the last name. So it should trigger the not blank on the first name because first name is blank, let's submit this. Because we haven't set up any error handling, we're going to get that white label error page, but that's what we're expecting. Okay, white label error page looking good. No explicit mapping for forward slash error. So you are seeing a fallback bad request 400. Let's look at our logs and we can see here field error, contact form on field first, reject a value because it was not empty. Great, looking good. Now just to prove that it does work in the case that it is provided, provide a first name here, click on submit and we do get that success once more. It's pretty good. What we can do to be a little bit more nice with things a little bit more nice. We can do to be a little bit more presentable, perhaps, is we can handle that error. And we can do that with our global exception handler, I think is probably a good pattern to use. So let's flip back here. And I'm going to, inside of our controllers, do a new file. And I'm going to call this one global exception handler.java. There we go. And then if I put the controller advice on here, anything that we specify exception handling wise inside of this class will then be uh, applied to the whole application. Now let's double check that exception that's being thrown, which we can see here is the bind exception. So let's copy this and let's do at exception handler public. And this will return a string in the same way that our controller would return a string. And we're going to say it's called bind exception. So let's call the method bind exception, taking a bind exception as an argument. But then we also need to specify on this annotation that we're handling the bind exception class. What probably makes sense in the case that we have a bind exception is to redirect to error. So that's what we'll do. So return a string, which is just redirect to error.html. So let's restart this application once more. And in the case that we trigger one of those bind exceptions, we should get redirected to error. Okay, Aaron. So that is our valid. If we remove our first name here, we're expecting to be redirected to the error HTML, which we have. So in summary, I've shown you how to handle a form submission using very basic HTML, CSS for a bit of styling, and then Spring Boot. We've been able to access that information as a map, and we've also been able to pass that information into a Java object that we can then use throughout our application as we like. Now in the wild, you would probably be using JavaScript to take the information and then post that information to a REST API. But if you have a very basic application, this is how you would do a form submission. And there we go, how you would do a very basic form submission in Spring Boot using HTML and maybe a bit of CSS for styling. Now, if you wanna take that one step further and get more into the REST API side of things, then check out this tutorial here where I teach you how to build a Spring Boot REST API completely from scratch. I'll see you over there.